Good morning, everyone. I hope the opening keynote was uh, enjoyable for all of you. Uh, my name is Gunnar Berg, and I'll be the room host here for Evergreen Ballroom A. Uh, as most of you see, hopefully there are uh, little bags in front of you with uh, snacks and goodies. Uh, feel free to take one. And if you don't have one at your seat, uh, I'm happy to bring one around to you uh, as well. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, Philip Lubacic uh, from Melissa Data. Uh, Philip began his tech career in 1987 with Microsoft working on operating systems. In 1999, he served as co-founder and CTO of a successful internet startup. And in 2009, he joined Melissa Data. And he has been working for the last 14 months on designing and building software to parse, validate, and geocode international addresses, which I'm sure will be very helpful for your presentation. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand it off to Philip. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Can you all hear me all right? Back when I was in my 20s, I left my, uh, my software development job with Microsoft and got myself a backpack and a rail pass and spent three months just traveling around Europe, seeing places, meeting people. And the thing that I got out of that was the degree of variation, the creativity, the kinds of variety in the ways that people live their lives and the way they do things. And that sort of creativity is the same creativity that people have used in creating international addresses. It's made for a lot of, of interesting ways of describing where people live, how they live, and, and how to get a hold of them. So what I'm going to try to do today in my presentation is talk to you a little bit to try to remove some of the anxiety from it, give you a little bit of a base understanding. To give you a little bit of background on myself, I'm not while I've traveled a little bit internationally, I don't have particularly grand language skills. You know, I took two years of, of high school French and first year, one year of college German, which uh, Frau Emerson had the grace to pass me on the second attempt. But, um, you know, you don't really need it to get in there. But what I want to talk about today, oops, can you tell me how to get to my presentation? Alt tab. Alt tab. Lovely. Alt and tab. Much more helpful, thank you. Okay. So to, for today, I'm going to talk to you about international addresses. And my goal for today is to get it so that, you are, that you're comfortable with them, have a sense of where to relate to them, and can start to use them in your organization. In preparation for this, I'm going to try to make this uh, at a level where it's easy for everyone to access. I'm going to assume that you're familiar with sending to US addresses. So if you haven't put uh, an address in an envelope and sent it, it's time to leave the room. It's probably not going to be a good presentation for you. <laughs> that you're competent in English and no other languages. As you can tell from me, um, English I can do all right with. The others, not so good. Um, I'm going to assume that you're not highly technical. If you are highly technical and you want to geek out about the details later after the presentation, come find me. I'm happy to chat with you anytime. I'm easy to find even in a large crowd. Um, and limited technical resources for international. Most of you, I assume, have busy day jobs with lots to do. You don't have a technical staff and a briefcase full of money sitting around for international. If you do happen to have a briefcase full of money, uh, Wendy at the back there would like to see you immediately after the presentation. <laughs> but if not, um, we'll assume that you have, you're working on a shoestring or that you're working on a relatively modest budget. And we'll, so with these assumptions, I'm going to try to stay away from jargon. I'm not going to try to introduce too many new terms, but we'll work on concepts. Uh, if you want to get down to more of the details for the specific jargon and, and names, we'll work on that after the presentation. But I want to get you a good grounding in it. So here's the, here's the basic structure of the presentation. I'm going to talk about similarities and differences between international addresses and US addresses. And I'm going to start with US addresses as a baseline. We'll look at US addresses and we'll start to see how international addresses are similar and different. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about guidelines for working with international addresses. If you're going to be uh, reaching out, trying to reach global alumni, try to uh, recruit for people, uh, try to raise donations from international sources, um, being able to handle their addresses is critical. And then finally, we'll get start how to figure out how to get started in your organization using international data. So let's talk about addresses in general. So right over here, let's see if I can get this fancy laser point. That was not the button I wanted. The laser pointer to work here. So basic US address. You can see 123 Pine Street, apartment 3G, Seattle, Washington, 98125. Pretty straightforward. All the stuff you're familiar with. Addresses 
all across the globe have the same basic structure. They have a specific area, something that tells the post office or the postal department in that country how to get it to the right station. That's, um, and we'll go into that in more detail, a street in that area, a street that's related to that postal area. And then figure out once you get to the street, how do you get to the right building on the street or the right complex on the street? And then from there, how you get into the building, how, where in the building to find it. All the addresses globally have this same structure. There's a very small fraction that don't, but it's not significant. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about areas. Areas in the United States are organized into a hierarchy, concentric areas. Like you can think about in the United States, how many of you are from the Northwest region? A few of you, Southwest? Okay. The US is broken up into those regions. They're not necessarily governmental regions, but they're regions that are largely accepted. And then you have states, then you have counties, or in Louisiana, par parishes or Alaska boroughs. And, in, and then you go down to cities and neighborhoods. Um, same all around the world. They call them different things, but they have that same type of nesting. Some of them are used for mail and some of them aren't. I mean, when was the last time you saw King County on a, on a piece of, of mail? It's always the city state zip in the US. The rules are different in other places. But that's the same, but it's the same general principle. And then postal codes. In the US, postal codes don't match up with cities. For example, Seattle has a bunch of postal codes. And my zip code has two different cities in it, Lake Forest Park and Shoreline, are both inside of the same zip code. So postal zip codes don't necessarily match up, or postal codes don't match up with those geographic or political areas. Sometimes they're more granular, sometimes they're not. So let's take a look at one example in specific. We'll look at France versus the United States. So in the United States, we have this stack of, of regions that we talked about or, or areas, country, region, state, county, city, and neighborhood. In France, they have country, region, department, arrondissement, forgive me if I butchered that one, canton, and commune. So these are the things that, th this is the area stack. People would talk about what department you're in or what canton you're in but they wouldn't necessarily put it in a letter. If they're gonna put it on a letter to send it to someone in France to send a letter from the US, you need to have the country, France, the commune, or the city neighborhood, and the postal code. Whereas in the United States, if you wanted to send something from France back here, you need to put USA, um, Washington, Bellevue, and then the postal code. So the general thing to take from this is that the post, that you know, there's a bunch of different areas and not all of them necessarily go on letters. Let me talk a little bit about postal codes for a minute. In the US, we're used to very simple postal codes. They're either five digits or five digits dash four digits. In the rest of the world, they're consistent inside of a country, but they can be different. You know, for example, a lot of them are pure numbers. You can have a 0742, that's, that's a postal code in some parts of the world. 98155, that's my zip code. And then a lot of them are mixed. Some of them have um, a combination of letters and numbers. Ones that you'll see in Europe often start with an abbreviation for the country. This is one for Finland. Here's one for Great Britain. And there's one for Brazil. So combination of letters and numbers, sometimes with some punctuation in the minute, some, middle, sometimes some spaces. Not every country uses postal codes. It depends on the postal, on the postal system for that country. Things that I want to make sure that you take away about areas, and this is, this is the, the bottom part of an address in almost every circumstance. Most countries have between two and seven of these area levels. Some levels are needed for mailing and some are not. And that ones that you, that you need vary by country and address. There are places in Great Britain where you have to actually specify the neighborhood as well. For those of you who are from Seattle, it would be like having to say Ballard, Seattle to get it to the right place. And if you didn't put in Ballard, it would go to the wrong place. So you have to include the ones that are correct for the address for that country and for that level. Questions? You guys are all awake, right? Okay. All right. So let's talk a little bit about streets. So in the United States, a street is pretty simple. Northeast Pine Street, First Avenue West, stuff you're all familiar with. You put it in a letter a thousand times. Um, we think about them in terms of four different things. The direction that comes before it, like northeast for Northeast Pine Street. 
the main street name, the type of street, which is street, boulevard, lane, loop, court. Um, there's actually about 35 of them that are supported by the US Post Office. Um, and then post direction, some, a direction that comes afterwards. Internationally, it's a little bit different. And this comes because of languages. You know, everyone's familiar with Lake Superior and the Great Salt Lake. How come lake comes on one side first of one of them and on the other side for the other one? It comes from the original language that was used to create it. So um, Lake Superior was named by the French originally. So you get things like this where you have, just like a US address, it's the same, except you can have the type in front of it. It would be like having street, uh, street pine instead of pine street. You know, examples here, Rue Victor Hugo uh, from France and Kirchenweg or Church Street in Germany. The um, other thing to notice about it that's a little bit different is that in some languages, the type of the street is attached. It's part of the word. It do, you don't get a space between that and the main word. Um, you'll see this in a lot of Asian countries where, where, the, where the convention is to, is to connect the characters one to the next. And in German, it's another place where you'll see it a lot. Okay, so things to, that are important to take from this. First of all, um, you can have leading types, which is something you're not used to seeing in the US. You may see it if you're used to sending mail to Canada, Quebec. Otherwise, you probably won't. The types can be attached. There's occasionally a dependent street. Now, this is something that's a little bit funky. Um, but in uh, Great Britain has one of the most complicated postal systems in the world. They have um, you know, a country that has thousands of years of, of Western occupation and built up small neighborhoods. They all decided to name their streets the same things, and no one wanted to change them. So what you have left with is you have to say what street it's off of. I mean, you can think of this in the US like, like a lot of highways have a frontage road. You know what that is? That's a, that's a road that's next to the highway where you put businesses so you don't interfere with the highway. It's like you have a frontage road, and you have to say what highway it's next to for it to make sense. So you could have um, a sea stone court, and you could have two of them in the same general postal code. And um, you have to say what the one that's off Station Road as opposed to the one that's off Burberry Place. It's a little weird. That one was kind of, kind of funky when I first saw it. But, but there are different types. So these are the main things to take away from the information about streets. So where on the street? Um, in the United States, we're used to house numbers. So a house number is a number, except in Hawaii, where it's a number, a dash, a number. So they're, in the US, you're, it's pretty simple what, what you're used to. Across the globe, it varies a little bit. In a lot of places, it's a pure number. Sometimes it's a number plus a letter, like 7A. And then you'll get cases where it's a, a number hyphenated with another number. You know, Daimler Strasse 32 to 34. I visited a person there in Germany, on, in Frankfurt, that was at that address. Um, slashes are really common, you know, 7 slash A, uh, 16, 14, whatnot. And then um, this one totally messed me up when I first started to see it. In India um, and a lot of other places of the globe, people talk in terms of, of references of landmarks. It's like, you know, my wife and I argue about how to give directions. I say like 16th Street, right on, right on Pine, left on Pike. And she says, go to the 7-Eleven, turn right. Go to the post office, turn left, it's the blue house with the white fence. And so, you know, in different parts of the world, they do things differently. And in India, across from the bank of New Delhi is a valid description of where a place, where to deliver mail on the street. So, and then sometimes buildings are necessarily. Again, thank you, Great Britain. But we have to, you have to give the name of the building to have your address be correct. So a little bit different than the US. So the, the critical things to take from this, house numbers are not just numbers. And they can be much bigger than they are in the United States. You can take up most of a line describing where on the street your, house, your, your building may be. Now, I'm not trying to distress you with all this. I'm just trying to give you guys a sense of what the differences are so that we can be comfortable as we go on with how to, how to do this. Okay. All right. So where in the building? So in the United States, we're used to things like apartment 3G, number sign 7, um, suite 16, floor 2, that kind of stuff. And in a lot of the world, it's the same kind of thing. You have um, sometimes things are separated with a house. Sometimes it'll come after. So like you could have house number 7, apartment 2. 
And sometimes it's going to be the other way. Like this is, this is common in Australia to have unit two, house number seven. So it's the second unit of this house. Um, sometimes there are indicators. There are like a super O with an underline underneath it and a little A with um, a super A that are used. And, and sometimes multiple levels of it. So again, there are, in every country they have their indicators. They have the thing that tells you this is, the, this is where you deliver it in the building. Um, and sometimes it's much more involved. One of the guys who works on my team for this, we have 18 different people who are contributing to the project in terms of learning about the countries, understanding how the countries are structured for their postal codes. He's from Romania, and he talks about a place from the city where he's in where you get the street address, and it gets you to the complex. And then you have to describe the building, the staircase, the floor, and the apartment on the floor to get your mail to that location. So again, just like in the U, just like the um, other things with this, the patterns vary by country. The location where you're going to find it in the address will vary. In the U.S., we always expect it to be at the end, after the after the main street. Um, sometimes in the others, it's in different places, and it can be much more involved. You can have a lot more detail in them. So I'm going to take a moment and talk about post boxes. In a lot of the world, they don't have um, to the door mail delivery like they do in most places in the United States. So a lot of people walk into town or travel to town to go and get their mail from the postal service there. Just like in the US, they have post boxes. They have an indicator that tells you this is a post box and these are the numbers that go along with it. You know, some places, in the US, it's very simple. You just have the area and then the post box. In other parts of the, of the world, you have, um, and you have to supply the street because the post office won't get it to the right set of post boxes if you don't tell them the street. And usually an indicator and then some combination of numbers and letters. Right. So here are a few simple examples of, of stuff. Um, these top two, this one's from the United States. This one's from Australia. They're both Subway sandwich shops. I probably shouldn't have done this right before lunch. Um, this is a restaurant in uh, Poland. And this is, this is uh, one of our offices in India, the Melissa Data office in India. So you can see they're all, they have similar structure. They have you know, country name. They have the, the area where the post office starts. And then you know, the street information and then how to deliver it on the street. So your intuition about the US is pretty similar. You know, you have those same different parts. They just look a little different. Questions, comments? Okay. So let's talk a little about getting started with international addresses. So you probably didn't come here just to learn the differences between what postal addresses look like in Australia and the United States. You probably actually wanted to do something with it, like reach your uh, alumni, reach prospective donors, that sort of thing. So I'll talk a little bit about gu guidelines for it. I'll talk a little bit about um, software that you can use to help make this a lot easier. And then I'll talk about templates for working with your addresses in your organization, depending on how much resources you have. So let's talk a little bit about the guidelines for it. First of all, you have to let go of your assumptions about what each of the parts look like. The formats are different, and they vary by country. An address that looks reasonable in Canada will not look reasonable in Australia. One that looks right in Germany is not going to look right in France. Um, and so you have to be able to, to be flexible on that. Don't make assumptions about what it's going to look like. Um, expect to use a lot more space. You can use seven lines. Typically, up to seven lines are necessary to, to put an address on a, on a piece of mail if you're going to send it internationally. Another, one, another thing to be aware of is don't expect to understand all the formats. You just, there's just too many formatting rules for each of the different countries. Um, so to illustrate that, I mean, how many of you know how to drive a car? A few of you? Yeah, pretty much everybody. Unless you live in an urban core, you probably do know how to drive. How many of you could repair the engine on your car? OK, a couple of you. You're better off than I am. Um, so you know, you use a car all day long. You go everywhere you need to go. You get everything done with it. But you don't have to necessarily understand all the technical details. You need to know how to operate it. You need to know how to get it to where you need it to go but you don't need to know much more beyond that, as long as you have someone or something taking care of those details for you. 
know how to drive, know the rules of the road, but then let somebody else handle the, handle the gory details of getting it all to run, okay? Um, don't bother to keep address parts separately. In the United States, we're sort of in the habit of breaking up our addresses into city, state, zip. We break it up into house number and the pre-directional and the post-directional and the core street name and the, and the suite number and all the rest of that. That's gonna get you in trouble with international. Unless you have a lot of specialization in a country, generally you wanna avoid that. I'll talk a little bit more about that as I get into how to operationalize this in your organization. But as a rule, don't bother to keep the address parts, store whole addresses. Um, copy and paste unfamiliar languages. So let me go back. All right, so you see this word here? How many of you would know how to type that on a US keyboard? I wouldn't. I mean, a lot of the stuff that you're gonna get, if it comes in an unfamiliar script, if it's in Arabic, if it's, if it's in Thai script, if it's in Chinese, you're not going to be able to, to type it in on your own keyboard. You're gonna to have to copy and paste. So you're gonna receive it electronically. The good news on that is almost every browser and all the large applications can handle international character sets by default. If you have older custom written software, sometimes it has a little bit of trouble, but for most of the stuff that's, that's in the last five or 10 years, it's gonna be able to handle it with cut and paste. Or you know, if you're doing elect or electronic transfer. The other thing is rely on software to handle details. There's a lot of, a lot of detail knowledge you need to, to have to get stuff formatted for the right for every country and software should handle that. You really don't, it's not a good use of your time to try to develop too much expertise except in a few circumstances and I'll talk about that a little later. Okay. So general guidelines. So um, international address software. So there's a, a few things that software will do for you. First thing is it's gonna tell you if your address is correct or not. Um, Everyone in the United States assumes they can look at an address and know that it's correct, but if you drop a digit or you add a digit or you change a northeast to a southeast or make some other typo, an address that looks right can be wrong. So you need something that has reference data in it to tell you whether your addresses are gonna be right or wrong. Um, it'll standardize your address. Every country has its own standards for how you organize an address and put it on an envelope, and the software should take care of all those details for you. If you've been storing your data inside of a, of a database that's made for US data, you probably had to drop something when you put the address into it. A good piece of software will fill in the missing pieces. It should be able to infer it. You know, for example, in the Netherlands, if you have the house number and the postal code, you can figure out what the entire rest of the address should be just from those two, those two pieces of information. Um, provide a formatted address. This is, this is just a block of text that you can close your eyes and print on an envelope. So it's, it's stored in a single, single database field or a single cell in a, in, a, in a spreadsheet, and it has the entire address that you can just mm, copy paste. And then it goes on the envelope and you don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, and then it'll give you a latitude and longitude for an address. This is important because most of the modeling you'll do, most of the visualization you're gonna do globally isn't gonna be based on knowing um, uh, what Queensland looks like or, or, or knowing the different provinces of Chile. I mean, you, you know, you're just not gonna know. So you're gonna do things in terms of lat longs and throw them on a map and look at them. So having the latitude and longitude um, is very helpful. So getting started with international, with international. So three I'm gonna present three different models for how to get started with it. The first one is if you don't have a lot of resources. This is you and whatever hours you can steal from whatever projects you already have assigned to you. Stuff you're gonna do you know, late in the afternoon when you can't stand to look at that spreadsheet one more time. Or um, you're gonna get you know, an intern who can help for a couple hours a week and a s small amounts of resources. The second one is where you have an established process where you've got um, data flowing through your systems, you know what you're doing with it already, it's US based, and you have to figure out how you're gonna leverage it for international. And then the third one is, is building from the ground up. You know, the suitcase full of money came in, you've got your technical team standing by, and you wanna make sure that you set it up so that you don't end up um, hamstringing yourself or painting yourself into a corner with um, by, by starting out on the wrong foot. Okay, so let's talk about what to do with minimal resources. So this, 
the assumption here is that your budget is less than $100 and you have less than a couple of hours a week or a month to spend on it. You have enough to experiment, enough to get started, but you really have no budget. Um, so get your addresses into a spreadsheet. If it's in a database, export it. If it's already in spreadsheets, you're already there. So get it started into a spreadsheet. And if it's broken up like a US address, assemble it like a US address. Um, a lot of the international software out there assumes that people have data in a US database and they just have to deal with that. Um, get an Excel plugin or send it to a service for processing. You know, so um, my company has an Excel plugin that you can just download for free and then um, right in your spreadsheet you can go and do international updates on your file. Give you your lat longs, it'll give you your um, uh, formatted address, it'll take care of all that stuff right in your spreadsheet or if you'd prefer to you can send it out to a service. There are other companies that do it. I'm familiar with, with mine, but there are other good companies out there as well who have these services. And it's not terribly expensive. If you're doing it in Excel, um, you know, you can do 200 addresses for less than $10. I mean, and that's, that's at, that, at that small volumes. If you get to larger volumes, it's a lot cheaper than that. So you're not going to bankrupt yourself getting started, starting to take a look at it. You can be done relatively inexpensively. And then um, once you've verified it, phone or email people whose addresses don't validate. You know, if you get someone who is from Thailand and your address wouldn't validate, email them or contact them and get them to email it to you so you can cut and paste it into your spreadsheet. Because they'll be able to enter the script. If they're familiar with the language, they'll know how to get it into, into a browser or into, into mail. Um, use Google Earth to visualize your data. You can go and if you just Google for um, latitude, longitude, display, Google Earth. You'll, you'll find links that will get you to a free spreadsheet where you copy and paste your data into it, you press a button, and it creates a file that you can, that you can just load up in Google Earth. And you can see all the points in your, in your data set showing up in Google Earth. You can zoom in on them. You can look at the ones that are grouped. They can be tagged so you can look to see which ones are in what areas. I mean, it's a great cheap way of getting yourself to the point where you're starting to understand where you're clustered. Where, where, are, the, where, is your, where are your addresses? Where are they going? And then when it's time to send it, just simple mail merge from your spreadsheet. You know, get it into a position, into, into some sort of format that, you're, that either your mail house can send or what? Yes? Yeah. Okay. So the so there are a couple of good resources on the web. Um, the UPU, um, the it's the United Postal Union has a good website. I I don't have the URL exactly off my my head, but that's um, they're a good resource for. Uh, information on what addresses should look like, and you will get a variety of opinions. When we started, when first started working on this project, um, we did a lot of research and, and got a variety of different answers for different countries. Some of the countries have their own postal service, but the UPU is a really good place to start. Get you good basic, good basic information. There's also um, the Melissa Data website has a, on its free lookups page has a global address verification space, so you can just cut and paste your address into it. I think it'll stop you after 50 a day so that you don't you know, run your 10,000 addresses on our free website. But um, it's, it'll be enough to give you a chance to take a look at it, get some lat longs for, for some stuff, and start to model it without really having to invest any money in it. And just a uh, brief pitch, there's a lot of good free stuff out there for US addresses as well on the Melissa Data website. Okay. All right. So this is what to do on a, on a shoestring. No money, a little bit of time, but that's where you want to get started. So let's suppose you have an existing process. You have a, a fairly involved system that handles US addresses, processes them, does a lot of things. So the things that you need to do um, to change an, an existing process. Now, some people out there who are database people will scoff at the concept of a minor database change. But there's, um, you know, to the extent that you can add fields, it's usually a lot less trouble than, than otherwise. So, Make sure that you have space for a formatted address and a lat long. If you don't already have a lat long in your database, you know, time to come into this millennium and add lat long for your database. But the formatted address is great because um, it, it, it's important to have that um, 
uh, available to you, okay? So process your data through a service. So if you're doing things in batch, if you do nightly runs on it, um, export it, send it out to a service, and have it processed, whether it's my company's service or any of our competitors. Just have someone take care of it for you. If you have a real-time process where you have employees in front of um, uh, an application where they're using it, where they're entering the data themselves, they probably won't be able to accurately enter the stuff if it's not in the language that they know how to handle. But if it is, um, you know, uh, English, French, German, Spanish, that covers a large number of, of countries where uh, people get, uh, get students from. Um, you can integrate with a SOAP or a REST service. They're available out there. My company has them, other companies have them as well. Something that you can call out from your application, verify the address in real time, and then make sure that what you're getting into your database is actually accurate and complete. And then when you're starting to do data matching, so this is, this is always one of the biggest problems for, for a database. You know, was the, was the address, name and address I entered last week for John Smith the same as the one I entered this week? Do those records go together? Does this donor record match up with this other donor record? When you're doing that and you're using international addresses, you have two options. You can use the formatted address, which is that complete address that goes on the envelope, because that will most likely be the same. You can get some variations in them, but it will most likely be well, good for matching. The other thing you can use is the latitude and longitude. Say that, you know, um, within, are these two latitudes and longitudes for John, sorry, English, latitude and longitude for John Smith the same? And if they are, then maybe it's the same John Smith. Because in different countries, you may not have exactly the same area information for them or the exact address information for them, particularly if it didn't verify entirely. Okay. Questions or comments on that? Yeah. So um, it depends on how good the reference data is for the different countries. In the United States, we're used to having rooftop latitudes and longitudes. In other parts of the world, Western Europe, typically it's going to be rooftop or um, within a few hundred meters on the street. Uh, in other countries, it's going to be center, centered on postal code or centered on an area. So you can end up having everybody from the same neighborhood have the same latitude and longitude. Again, it depends on the reference data. Um, you know, rooftop, my, con my company has has 40 to 60 countries, depending on which cities in those countries are at rooftop level. Others are at area levels. And again, it depends on what's available for those particular countries. So you have to, um, when you look at it, you'll have to be, uh, apply some common sense to, the, to it. If you see all of them clustered, this is one reason to visualize your data, throw it up in Google Earth or some other visualization tool. If they are all clustered too tightly together, you. It's of, it's of less use to have used the latitude and longitude. Okay. Yes? Are you suggesting internal, or that we should sort of on the No, no, no. A latitude and longitude shouldn't go on the envelope. I mean, there are, there are people out there who are advocating for latitude, longitude-based addressing for things, but those, are, those have not gotten general acceptance. So um, yeah, just the, the formatted address is what you'd put on an envelope. So let's talk about a ground up build. So you've got um, your suitcase full of money and your technical team and you're ready to go. So you want to design around international data. So the first thing you do is you limit your format assumptions. Anyone who made a database in the United States made an assumption about how long the street was going to be. Usually that's about 40 characters long in that range. So the problem with that is things like in the US, I mean, we have our heroes. Everybody loves their heroes. In the United States, you can find a Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. So that's going to stretch it. And everywhere else in the world, everyone has their heroes, and they name all their streets after their heroes. And depending on your language and how, ver how verbose that language is, the number of characters, you can get some horrendously long street names. So limit your assumptions about the fields. House numbers are not just numbers. Um, Postal codes are not just numbers. They're not, they're not always going to be five digits. So um, be general in your assumptions. Don't make assumptions you don't have to about any field that you're going to store. Um, store the formatted address because even if you, if you store the parts, you won't be able to reassemble it correctly. There are too many conditional rules. 
in this part of the country for this street you have to include the neighborhood, in this part you don't. In this place you have to include the county, in this place you don't. So store the formatted address, don't assume you can reassemble it like you do in the United States. Um, again, store the latitude and longitude, you know, it's this millennium, latitude and longitude, you gotta have it. Um, consider internationally aware deduping software. Um, my company is working on, on deduping software that handles international better. You can use our US product on it, but it works better to have stuff that's, that's internationally aware. And then latitude, longitude with a bubble for matching, you know, as, as a way of matching up your records. Um, store the address lines uh, in your database. You need to save space for seven of them. In the United States, we typically do address line one, address line two, and then the city-state zip line. Sometimes people are, are, are profligate with their space and they use four lines. But you need to have seven available for you if you're gonna be sending internationally. Um, most countries don't use seven, but you'll be sad if you get to one of the ones that does and you wanna send something to them. And seven area levels. Yes? Okay, so um, the longest character line, again, it varies by country. Um, typically, you're not gonna see a line more than about 60 or, six, or 65 characters. You'll end up wrapping the line because it's not gonna fit in an envelope right. when you start to get too long. Yeah. Yes? So if we don't have the seven lines, but we've got the lengths, on, a, on places that do require the seven, is there gonna be a problem if you put two on one? If you, if you separate it with a comma or something like that, the post offices have, are, are used to dealing with that. I mean, one of the things that, um, that one of the folks on my team observed was that there are rules everywhere, but nobody follows them. And if you ask someone from the post office about, about it, they'll say, people are stupid. They do the wrong thing. You tell them exactly how it's supposed to be on the letter, and they won't do it. So, you know, I'm not suggesting that that it's intent, you should intentionally do that, but if you don't have the space, do what will fit, and, and it's usually a human handling the envelope, and they'll, and they'll work it out to the best of their ability. Yeah? How is it affected if you're mailing um, within the U.S. to get it outside of the U.S.? I mean, how does the post office know these five lines and you know, the zip code or whatever the formatting isn't correct? Or there's a different, what do you know <coughs> Right. So um, the, your best bet is to try to verify the address up front and, and get some software to do that. But um, so like on these addresses, the, the US Post Office, it, when they look at an address, they're going to see, oh, it's for Poland. OK, we'll stuff it in the bin for Poland, and it's up to the Polish postal system to deal with it. So the US is not going to attempt to verify any of this data here. So. They'll, sh they'll ship it to Poland and, you know, based on, on the country being in the last line of it. Yeah, so it would be nice if they would do the same sorts of detailed service and return mail that they do here. Different postal services in different countries have different things. The Deutsche Post, the German postal service, is really well developed. They have good services. Uh, the one for Great Britain and Australia also are very, very good postal services with a lot of services and very, you know, strict rules for how things get set up. And then beyond that, it, it's going to really depend on the country. Some are, some are going to help be helpful and some aren't. OK, where was I here? OK, all right. Um, let's see. So, um, so st any, of the good, any of the good software is going to give you the option of storing the the address parsed down to the NAT's eyebrows. It's gonna give you the pre-directional, the post-directional, and the pre-directional and the post-directional for the dependent street, you know, down to, the, to, to very fine detail. And frankly, you don't need most of it. It's just gonna waste space in your database, and it's gonna confuse people when they look at it. So in general, unless you're going to have a presence in that country, like if you're going to have um, someone inside of Great Britain sending mail for you, you don't need to store that. In a lot of, in a lot of Europe, what they, in the European Union, they do a lot of cross-border mailings. And so what they do, they have the concept of delivery lines and then the areas. 
So back in that original diagram that I showed you, the stuff that was in, was in red, the area information, they store that broken out and they store the postal code broken out. But everything that tells you about the street and where on the street and where in the building, they just leave that as a block and they don't mess with it. So that is a strategy that you can also employ here if you want to be able to store your information. Um, I've been hammering on the, uh, the formatted address because I think it's really useful. The other thing about the formatted address is you can store it in a single field in your database or your spreadsheet. If you put um, either carriage returns or some other character you can replace with carriage returns in there, you can store it in a single database field and you don't have to worry so much about it. You just know that when you print it out on the envelope, it gets, you know, this is the place where you insert the lines. Okay. Yes? Yes, you do want to store in the native character set. Um, when we put that on an envelope, for instance, Japan, we always have trouble with Japan. So yes. You know, we'll put that with the English character set. It doesn't get the rest of the book. We put it with the Japanese character set. We have trouble with the rest of the book. So how do you deal with that? Right. So, you have, so to get it out of the country, you have to make sure that the country information is correct at the bottom of the address. That's where the USPS is going to look for it for getting it sent there. Um, and then beyond that, you know, put it in the same place on the envelope that you would for a U.S. address when you're sending it, and make sure that everything above the country written in English is in, in the language that you expect, because the handoff goes between the U.S. Postal Service and their Postal Service. Um, and the U.S. Postal Service is going to look at the last line of the address to say who to hand it off to. Yeah. So, in general, you don't want to try to transliterate back and forth between the different languages. Um, going back to the um, example that we had back up here. Um, so this Polish address, you can strip off the little slash from the middle of the L, and you can sla st um, strip off the, the accents from the different letters. And it will probably get there. So in, in, Latin, in, in countries that use a mostly Latin character set, you can get away with stripping those off but you're better off to leave them in because they are significant. And you know, part, of, part of what you're doing in fundraising is your relationship building. And if you make it look like an American put it on the postal thing, you know, they typed it in a US keyboard and they didn't care that it, came, that it was for someone who's in Poland, you, you're losing relationship points. So you really want to try to, to the best extent possible, make it look like you know and you care that, that this person has a different language than you do and that they express themselves differently. So, Part of this, part of getting international right, is about relationship building. Yes? So if you're suggesting storing the foreign address in, in a formatted address block, how does that work with the confusing tools uh, with international standards? Right. So with, um, excuse me, with, uh, with a deduping tool, you can use, um, like, for example, my company has a product called MatchUp. And so what it does is it allows you to define which fields you want to look at when comparing two records together. So in MatchUp, you'd say, I want to use the formatted address along with the first name and the last name as, as fields to, to, to use for deduping. If you have your own software that you're using for it, using the formatted address as a whole block, as just as a key for matching them or as uh, initially connecting them. The, if you have some variation in those, you're not going to get perfect matches. If somebody um, used uh, an L with a slash and somebody else did an L without a slash on it, they're not going to compare at the, at the byte level. So you're going to end up with mismatches, which is why I suggest also looking at the latitude and longitude for the address as, as a way of grouping them together. So we have a bubble of, of five miles here around this address. Do two people have the same name? That's they may be the same, you know. Okay. Yes? Does your format address as return? Say that again, please. Does your format address for Melissa, does it have the carriage return in the format address? So the formatted address for the Melissa data product allows you to set which character you use as the line separator. So if you want to use a pipe symbol or you want to use a semicolon or you want to use uh, whatever character you want to, you can specify that. Yes? I'm kind of curious. Um, it seems to me that if you're going to 
Unicode and have the civilian language, your whole database basically has to be a Unicode database. So that's true and it's not, but keep going. But, but even then, it strikes me that if you're not a language expert, at least moderately competent language, there is, I cannot imagine a practical way that uh, you could, for instance, I, I would not know how to put a Chinese address in the native Chinese language into the database, even if it did support a Unicode. So that's why you work with the formatted address. You're not going to try to figure out which parts go in which slots. You take one value. I, I, I get an envelope in the mail and it has the address. I can't cut and paste from the envelope no. into my database. Right, no. So if you're, if you're working with hard copy and getting that in, it, it, I don't have a really good solution for it. I wish I could say you automatically wave your hand over it or you, you, know, you scan it and you OCR it and whatever and it'll work, but I can't promise that. I mean, the... the you pretty much have to get it in an electronic format or have someone who understands a language key it in for you. I, I wish it was different, but I don't have a better solution than that. The databases um, can handle uh, Unicode. Like if you're using SQL Server, um, the, the, excuse me, the, the native language for that is, or it uses a UTF-16, which uh, I, didn't, I said I wouldn't get into jargon, and I, forgive me, I'm gonna do it for like 30 seconds before the thing gets up. UTF-16 is a way of, of storing data that uses um, two bytes or two, two US characters, you can think about it, to store each character. And that makes it easy for most characters. It makes it easy to store um, global languages. UTF-8 is, is, a, is a variation on, on storing it that, sa that says, most of my data is US data, and some of it's not, so we'll use more bytes or more information for each character that's not from the US keyboard. So um, those, are the, those are the two variations. Um, okay, so the, the last thing here is, um, you know, as we kind of got in a little bit into, into the Unicode representation, that's, that's the way that the computer represents the characters. There's two really big ones to use, the one that SQL Server uses all the time and ones that are easy to use if you have mostly a US database. Um, pick one and stick with it. Um, don't worry about which one you pick. Pick the one that, that your software likes best, but pick one and stick with it because you'll be happier. Okay. Yes? Just curious about international phone numbers. Uh -huh. Is that part of validating formatting that part of uh, what's So uh, Melissa Data does have an international phone object that does the same thing with it um, so that you can pass in, an, in a phone number and we'll tell you whether it's formatted correctly or not. Um, you know, we can't always tell you whether it's going to ring to the phone you think it's going to ring to or whether it will ring at all, but we can tell you whether the numbers are in the right order and they're grouped appropriately. Yes? So, um, it seems that particularly this issue of non-Latin non scripts for those of us who work normally only Latin scripts on, um, that having to format two formatted addresses so you can actually hold the same address in two scripts if needed. Yes. Right. You can get away with that, yeah. Um, and then the, the second one is why it's useful to do that is because it, you're doing any of that other kind of data mining, but mostly what you do is read and understand Latin scripts. It's much easier to data mine off of something. Well, this is always a Latin script. Here's the one you're going to send. It might or might not be Latin script. So it, again, it comes down to how are you going to data mine and what are you going to look at. If you're building from the ground up and you store the area information, most of your demographics are going to be tied to area or you can tie it off of lat long. So if you start it with latitude and longitude, you can, you can get all the detail information. And to prove that to yourself, enter a latitude and longitude into Google and it will tell you the name, the address, the area. I mean, reverse geocoding will get you that information. So it can be derived later on from the latitude and longitude. But you, uh, unless you have uh, a demographics product that's specific for a country like Germany or Great Britain, you're not gonna, you're not going to need to, or it won't be helpful to go and try to break out the street address itself. The area will get you most of where you need to get to go, to go on that. So I am told that I am out of time. So um, 
thank you very much for coming today. And if you do have any questions, uh, I should expect to be around today. And so um, come find me. Um, yes, Wendy, you were saying something? Oh, we have uh, Melissa data um, jump drives if you'd like to grab one from Wendy on the way out. Cool. Right. Thank you. And again, find me if you want to talk about details. <laughs>